texting me too. Welcome to Cleveland Baptist Church this Wednesday night. Take your songbooks, if you would, please turn to page 236. Whosoever will may come. Let's all stand up. We'll sing all three verses. Whosoever will. Whosoever heareth, shout, shout the sound. Spread the blessed tidings all the world around. Tell the joyful news wherever man is found. Whosoever will may come, whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill, tis a loving Father calls a wanderer home, whosoever will may come, whosoever cometh need not delay, now the door is open, enter while you may. Jesus is the true, the only living way. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will. Send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls a wanderer home. Whosoever will. May come on the last. Whosoever will, the promise is secure. Whosoever will, forever must endure. Whosoever will, tis life forevermore. Whosoever will, may come. Whosoever will, whosoever will, send the proclamation over vale and hill. Tis a loving Father calls a wanderer home. Whosoever will may come. Good singing. Turn over to page 98. 98. Jesus loves even me. You're going to find something similar between these two songs. I'll ask you after the second verse if anybody has found it. After the second verse. Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. I'm the second. Though I forgot him and wandered away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. All right, anybody know what's similar, what is common to these two songs? It's a tough one. If you have your book out, they're written by the same person, Philip Bliss. Almost 200 years ago, this song. I mean, and it's so applicable to today. Things, things don't change. Though I forget him and wander away. Wow, like, like all of us. Man, let's sing the third verse. Oh, if there's only one thing I can sing When in his beauty I see the dear King Then shall my song in eternity be Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me I am so glad that Jesus loves me Jesus loves even me if you're so glad Jesus loves me, say amen. 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 
All right, let's be seated. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brother Jones. Uh, hopefully you got a copy of the prayer sheet. We're going to go over that in just a minute. Uh, I'll share a few things with you and some announcements. We have a thank you card to share with you. I'd like to start off saying thank you to our church family. On this past Sunday, uh, we had an opportunity to take 52 of our first through sixth grade bus riders uh, to Halloran Skate Park, and we had a pizza party with them, and each of them, uh, as well as the kids that were here, uh, got, uh, got uh, book bags full, filled with school supplies, and we couldn't have done that without your help, and we just want to say thank you. And it was uh, just a fun time. It was something that we, we allowed Calvin to kind of, it was kind of his idea, and he wanted to stick around before he went back to school with that. And so we kind of let him do it, and it was just uh, it was a good opportunity for him. But it was amazing. As the kids were leaving, I heard two of the kids say, this is the best day ever. And I thought, well, what, a, what a, a neat thing to say. And so, church, we couldn't have done that without your help, and we appreciate it. We had a whole host of bus workers there to help us out with that, and we just we thank you all uh, for doing that. Uh, let's see. Let's start off with a couple of letters, and then we'll go into the uh, prayer sheet, and then we'll share some announcements with you. Every once in a while, we get an anonymous letter, and usually we send those straight to the pastor, because that's usually who they're meant for, but this one, this one comes anonymous, and Michelle gave it to me. She says, you'll want to read this one. Uh, Cleveland Baptist Church, this is August of, uh, of this month, it just came in uh, yesterday. Cleveland Baptist Church, thank you. Thank you all for stopping by my home while door knocking. Not only did it save my walk with Jesus, it saved my life. Thank you. You will never be enough for what has been done for me. Eternally grateful, a friend in Jesus. So you just never know. You just never know what an impact you can make when you, when you encourage someone and when you give them a gospel track and you just, you, you're about uh, the Lord's work. Uh, this next letter comes from uh, Pastor Dan Novi. If you look on the prayer sheet, Brother Novi is our uh, preacher of the week that we're praying for, so we thought it was quite fitting that we would share his letter with you, and he sends it out to all of his supporting churches. He is, uh, you know, staying on his own as far as financially, but he still wants to let uh, church families uh, know uh, what's going on. So, dear pastor and church, I hope that this letter finds you well, and I want to begin by simply thanking you for your faithfulness to your community and to us as we have sought to restart and revitalize the Grand River Baptist Church. We've had quite a busy few months, and I'd like to update you on, uh, along with some of the matters of prayer that we ask for your support. So far this year, we've sent out over 15,000 pieces of literature. We've hosted a memorial orchestra concert and cookout, a friend, family, and neighbor day, and just completed our summer's vacation Bible school this past year, this past week. <clears throat> Our last 10-week uh, summer average attendance is 41 on Sunday mornings. And we have seen eight professions of faith and two baptisms since March. Since last summer, we've been able to add a teen class along with a Patch the Pirate and Pee Wee Kid classes. This summer, as we begin a small choir, we've also seen two ladies step into the children's ministries as teachers. Our Sunday school afternoon door knocking group has four faithful men and two teens going out each week. It's been neat to see some developing fruit. I can't compare our ministry to others, but I am thankful for the fruit that God has given our church and for the other churches without comparison. This is from Pastor Dan Novi. So I thought we could share that with you and you would be encouraged to hear that update. Uh, I'd like to, to read a uh, thank you note here. This comes from the Salvatierra family. And dear Pastor Pete and CBC Church family, thank you for allowing us to stay in your beautiful missions house again. It was such a blessing to see you all again and to spend time with you before we move to the mission field in a few weeks. Thank you all for your faithful support and prayers and godly influence. Love With love because of Christ, the Salvatiers, missionaries to Bolivia. So they're grateful for that, and it was good to spend some time uh, with them. All right, hope you have a copy of the, uh, the prayer sheet. Our CBC Missionary of the Week, Verl and Sandy Stoniker, continue to lift them up in prayer. The Bible College, we mentioned Pastor Novi. Uh, the Bible College, the Faithway Baptist College of Canada, uh, first responder this week, Sister Deborah Green, grateful for all that she does in her work as well as here at the church. Staff member, Sister Andrea Duarte, continue to lift her up in prayer. And then upcoming events to pray for, pray for the school year. School starts tomorrow, so we're excited about that, looking forward to what the Lord will have. Uh, the uh, Teen uh, Harvest Rally, uh, I believe Brother Dave Young is preaching this year, and that'll be on September the 9th on Saturday. Uh, so pray for the teens and pray for the counselors, the adults that go with the teens and spend almost 14 hours with those kids that, on that day. So lift, lift them up in prayer. Uh, there's some names here, some folks you can send a card and encourage, Brother George Johnson, 
Jack and Cora Kinder, and then Joe Keller. Many of you might not know Joe. Joe's been a friend of our, uh, quite a few people here in our church. His mother uh, went home to be with the Lord this past week, and it will be an encouragement uh, to him uh, to know that you're praying for him. Continue to pray for, on the right-hand side here, continue to pray for Brother Bill Yeager. It was good to see him uh, this past Sunday. Pray for his recovery. Uh, Brian Thomas was here with us as well, and it was good to see him and encourage him, let him know that we've been praying for him. It's also good to see Brittany Ross back here again with us. Continue to lift her up in prayer and her family and her husband. Uh, Sister Donna Marita is going to be having surgery on September the 10th. I know she would appreciate your prayers. We continue to pray for Jean Shear uh, with her recovery and just uh, the, the physical strength that she needs. And um, Sarah Robbins down here on, uh, towards the bottom. This is Brother Robert Robbins' granddaughter. A very uh, difficult and complicated pregnancy. And last update I heard is that she goes into the doctor, I believe it's once a week, just to check her, uh, her, uh, her, uh, her blood each week to make sure that things are going on track here. And uh, Sister Johnson's asked us to pray for Tiffany. Uh, that's mentioned there. On the other side here, quite a, few quite a few folks are asking to pray for some unsaved family members and some unsaved friends in their lives. Again, you just never know what a gospel track might do. And so just uh, lift all these folks up in prayer. Our expectant mothers, I know they would continue to appreciate your prayers. All of our service people. Uh, those that faithfully serve our country. Uh, it's good to see Sister Fran Palmasano here with us again tonight. I encourage her, let her know you're praying for her. Uh, Brother Brian Miller and uh, Eva Sherman, both these folks as well, are dealing with just the treatments from cancer, and I know they would be encouraged uh, to know that you're praying for them. Uh, just a few announcements before we pray. Uh, the Adult Bible Fellowships will start meeting again on September the 6th. And here's what I need you to do. A lot of you are procrastinators. A lot of us, let's be honest. A lot of us are procrastinators. And uh, we need you to sign up for this class. This will help us determine which, which location the classes are going to be in. So if you go to clevelandbaptist.org, clevelandbaptist.org, and you'll see right along the top, there's a, there's a tab there where you can register for the classes. All the classes will be listed and, uh, based on age and stage of life. And again, it would be an encouragement, a great help if you can do that as quickly as possible. And those classes will start meeting on September the 6th. You'll go right to your classes. We, have an, we still have the auditorium Bible class. Uh, that'll be meeting. And then the other classes there uh, will be listed. And it also starts the basic Bible doctrine class. Many of you are new to Cleveland Baptist Church or if you're a new believer. Or as Pastor mentioned on, on Sunday, if you just want to get a refresher on some of the basics of, the, of, of our faith, I'd like to encourage you to sign up for this class. Brother Jack Beaver uh, teaches this class faithfully, does a wonderful job. You're going to start on time, and you may go a couple minutes late, but I promise you you'll start on time every time. And uh, so it's a 15-week class. You're allowed to miss, I think, two or three of those classes, and he'll work very diligent with you to make them up, and it'll be a great help you know, to you and your faith. Uh, so again, if you're new to Cleveland Baptist or if you're a new believer, we especially want to encourage you to attend those classes. If you have any questions about that, please see Brother Beaver. And there's also there's a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center, even if you just have some questions about it. Well, what's this going to be about? He can answer that and be a great encouragement to you. Uh, Super Saturday is going to be on the calendar there. The, I think that's the uh, second or third Saturday in September, September the 16th. And we'll meet here in Folger Fellowship Hall. Very Precious Seed will be up and running, putting together John and Romans. And then, Lord willing, weather permitting, we'll go out and do some canvassing as well. And then, uh, last announcement, the uh, CBC Couples Retreat, uh, the 19th Annual Couples Retreat. The information has been mailed out. Some of you might be new to the church, and we just we weren't able to get that in the mail out to you. I'd like to encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center. There's a registration paper. has all the details of the rooms available and the cost and all that, all that information. If you have any questions about that, please see me and uh, let me know. We are praying for the Sears and family. Uh, Brother uh, Searson's uh, father, Chuck, went home to be with the Lord. So I know that, that he would appreciate your prayers, and the pastor will share the arrangements here with you in just a moment. Uh, let's pray, and the pastor will come forward to preach. Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, for the privilege we have to gather together. We thank you for just a time where we can really just uh, catch our breath a little bit during the week and just uh, be fed spiritually from your word. And I do pray for pastor as he brings forth the message tonight that it would encourage us. We're excited and We've really enjoyed this study through the life of, uh, of the book of Philemon. And uh, God, we're grateful for what you've done in our hearts and our lives. And we thank you for uh, the many people that we have on this prayer sheet. And Lord, while we don't understand uh, all the things that they're going through and the uh, fears and thoughts that are, that are crossing their minds, we know that there's someone that, that loves them, someone that we know that loves them, or uh, people that we know ourselves that uh, we're, we're burdened for them. And we're asking God that you'd meet the needs of their life. 
Uh, we do pray that you continue to be with uh, all the CBC missionaries. We think specifically the Stalin Kurds continue to bless them in this stage of their ministry. We ask you to continue to bless our brother Novi. Lord, give him fruit that will remain. We pray to just be with this uh, church family as they are excited about what you're doing in their midst. We thank you for Faithway Baptist College of Canada and what a great work that they're accomplishing there in our neighbor to the north. And we just pray, God, you give them uh, young men and young women that are willing to give their lives to the cause of Christ and, and be educated and be uh, mentored and, and, and get the, the foundation that they need. And we thank you for all the staff members, our first responders. Thank you for Sister Green and all that she does. And look forward to uh, different activities we have coming up. And we're, we're grateful for many of the names on this list that have been answered prayer. It's good to see Brother Yeager here this past Sunday. We pray, God, you continue to help him in his recovery. And certainly an encouragement to see Brittany. We ask God that you continue to have your hand upon her in that entire situation and uh, all the details and with her husband and all that's going to be going on, getting them uh, reacclimated, resituated here back in Northeast Ohio. We pray that, Lord, you'd be with her family as well. We thank you for Donna Marita. Lord, we ask you to be with the surgery that she's going to be having here in just a couple of weeks. And Sister Jean Shear, continue to lift her up in prayer. Sarah Robbins, many others, Lord, uh, that you know that are on our heart and our mind. And Lord, we're just asking that each of these situations, that your will would be accomplished. We thank you for those that have uh, shared with their church family. They have a burden for someone uh, that's lost. They have a burden for a friend. They have a burden for a uh, family member. And just, uh, Lord, give us courage. Give us boldness to continue to pro proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do thank you for Sister Fran Palmasano, uh, Brian Miller, uh, Brother uh, Paul Foradora, Think of Eva Sherman as well, and these, these folks, as they uh, battle this uh, horrible disease, uh, cancer. We pray, God, that you would uh, be with the doctors and the nurses and the caretakers and people that come alongside to help bear that burden. We pray, God, that you would just uh, encourage them, help them know that there's a church family that loves them and that is praying for them and, and desiring uh, your perfect will in their lives. And Lord, just uh, bless our, our night tonight and give us a wonderful time around your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks, Brother Tom, and appreciate that very much. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Philemon. First chapter, the only chapter in the book of Philemon, is uh, where we'll be once again this evening. We've been in this book throughout the uh, summer months that we've been together, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, the study of it. Hopefully, it's been a help to you as well uh, in your spiritual walk and spiritual journey. While you're turning there, I wanted to mention a few things uh, to us here just by way of announcement. Uh, I wanted to uh, just share with you briefly the uh, funeral arrangements for uh, Mr. Chuck Searson. Uh, Chuck was not a member of our church, but he attended uh, sporadically, of course. Uh, Randy and, and Debbie are uh, faithful folks here, and then obviously at, at a point in the past, uh, his son Dan was also uh, plugged in and involved here as well. Uh, but um, this, the arrangements are that there'll be a service on Tuesday night uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Humanic Funeral Chapel. Uh, that's at 14200 Snow Road in Brook Park. Again, it's Humanic uh, Funeral Chapel there in Brook Park, Ohio. And then uh, the family and uh, those that would like to will meet again on Wednesday morning at 1030 at the funeral home before they transition down to the National Cemetery at Rittman at 1115. So really two opportunities uh, for you if you'd like to go by and minister to the family, encourage them. It would be Tuesday night at 7 o'clock or Wednesday morning at 10.30. And so again, wanted you uh, to be aware of those things. And many of you, of course, have been watching uh, the situation that has been unfolding uh, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, and of course, uh, we have in years past, and in, and in uh, I, I suppose maybe in crises past, we've tried to partner together with uh, an organization known as Nehemiah's Network out of Columbia Road Baptist Church. And um, typically, they send a semi-truck uh, trailer load of, of, of items, supplies, when there's a natural, national, natural disaster. Um, but that's a little hard to do when the natural disaster takes place in Hawaii. And, uh, and so um, uh, there's been some conversations with uh, Brother Jenkins, and uh, there is a pastor there in the Lahaina area, which seems to be the area that's most hard hit of a Baptist church. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, to try to send them some, uh, some resources financially so uh, that they can be a help to the people there. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is through a fundraiser that'll take place here on Sunday, September the 17th. And many of you know Brother Hank Okuma and are familiar with uh, his Hawaiian luau's uh, that he does. And so he's going to provide that on a Sunday afternoon for folks that would like to be involved in that. There'll be a meal out in the gymnasium. 
It'll be by donation only, whatever you feel led of the Lord to give, but we want you to give generously. And uh, all of that, Lord willing, all of the food will hopefully be donated so that all of the proceeds will be able to go directly to uh, that pastor and that church there in the state of Hawaii. We'll say a little bit more about that as we get a little bit closer, but uh, we did want you to be aware of that here this evening. Perhaps maybe even begin to think of inviting some folks to come with you on that Sunday morning and to let them know, hey, we're going to participate in this fundraiser. And most people are sensitive as they think about what's happening there in that part of the country. And, uh, and so, again, it might, might be an opportunity to get some guests and visitors here that day, buy them lunch, and all of it, of course, will go to a good cause. Then I also want to let you know that this coming Sunday, uh, we will host um, a Sister Bonnie Wilson. And uh, Bonnie Wilson has been a, a missionary. She and her husband for many years in the country of Mexico. And uh, she is home uh, on a, a brief furlough. Her husband has gone home to be with the Lord, uh, but Bonnie is still uh, trying to serve faithfully there in the country of Mexico, and uh, just wants to give a report to our church, and so I'm looking forward uh, to hosting her. She'll be with us all day on Sunday, but we'll hear from her specifically uh, by way of testimony on Sunday night. So again, I wanted you to be aware of that, and you see, you see her on Sunday, be on the lookout, try to encourage her, and again, thank her for her faithfulness. I think we've partnered together with her for many, many years, and so again, we're looking forward to hearing how the Lord has blessed uh, their ministry and that partnership. Well, you're in Philemon. Uh, let's look in verses 18 and 19 tonight. Uh, that's where we'll be here as we uh, continue our walk through this particular book. The Bible says, speaking of uh, Onesimus, uh, Paul writes, if he hath wronged thee, Philemon, if Onesimus hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Now, I want to talk to you about a very, very depressing subject tonight, <laughs> and that subject is debt. Now, but I want you to notice that there is a very, very positive spin on it in this particular text. The title of the message this evening is Debt Free. Debt Free. The United States of America, most of you are aware, holds a historic national debt as of this month of 2023. Currently, as a country, we are $32.6 trillion in debt as a nation. You say, what exactly does, does that mean? Well, I don't necessarily know that I understand all that it means, but as I spent some time researching it, this means that the debt is is, is the, the equivalent of $97,492 per U.S. citizen. So every citizen in the United States of America, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they are, regardless of any of that, every single person you see that is a citizen of the United States of America, they owe, if, if you were to break it down into this, into this way, they owe $97,000. Here's another way to look at it, that... Uh, that number becomes $253,686 per taxpayer. You see, not every U.S. citizen is a taxpayer, but those that are would owe the equivalent of $253,000 or a quarter of a, of a million dollars. almost can't even say it without stumbling over those words. It's hard to fathom. To put this into a, a bit more perspective, consider that in the United States of America currently, the median family or the average family income is $70,784. Now again, that's average. That's, some of you are sitting here saying, man, I don't make nearly that much. And some of you are saying, well, that's a whole lot less than I do. And of course, this is just taking the average. That's what the idea of a median uh, concept is, all right? So, so if a family is making $70,000, to compare it to what's happening in our country uh, today, that same family, uh, if they spent money like the federal government spends money every year, here's how much they would spend every year. They would spend $90,663 per year. So they're bringing in 70000 and if they spend like the government spends, which I certainly hope you don't, they're spending, they're spending well over, almost $20,000, well over $19,000 more a year than they're bringing in. And, 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 and so they're putting that kind of money on a credit card despite, despite already being $447,142 in debt. 
we're trying to, again, put this in perspective. You were to look at it like, okay, what, is this, what would this mean for an individual family? What kind of trouble would a family be in? Okay, here they are. They, they owe almost a, a half a million dollars in debt. They're only making $70,000 a year, and they're spending more than $90,000 per year. And so as a result, every year they're putting almost $20,000 additional on a credit card while already owing $447,000 in debt. In other words, it's a mess is what it is. It's a mess. In a case, a classic case of follow the leader, American household debt is steadily climbing as well. So people are sitting here saying, well, if the U.S. government can do it, why can't we? And so they're uh, mimicking what they're seeing out of our leaders. Americans owe $986 billion in credit card debt. Now think about that for a while. That's a lot of money that Americans owe in credit card debt, and I'm sure that number is climbing steadily each and every month. They owe $11.92 trillion on mortgage debt. They owe $1.55 trillion on vehicle loans and $1.6 trillion on student loans. Now, now, now Webster, in his, in, his, in his dictionary, he defines debt as that which is due from one person to another, whether money, goods, or services that which one person is bound to pay or perform to another. Then as you continue reading down his, his, uh, his description or his definition of debt, he makes this statement that I thought was so good. He says this, when you run in debt, you give to another power over your liberty. Which is certainly one of the reasons why the word of God warns against the borrower being servant uh, to the lender warns against uh, that type of activity and that type of habit. Uh, many, many of you f- be familiar with the name Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey has given his life to helping people get on good ground financially, and he has come to this conclusion about Americans. Here's the conclusion. He says this, normal is broke. Normal is broke. That's a pretty sad conclusion, but I, I suppose he's probably right on. With people making more money than ever, you would think that this idea of normal is broke would be a faulty assumption, but the numbers that we have just given relay Dave Ramsey's assessment to be true about our culture. I have to tell you that being in financial debt is a miserable way to live, and I'm not here to talk about that necessarily tonight other than just to build a case of uh, of how difficult debt can be in the life of a family or in the life of a country um, and I would, just, I would just warn you to, uh, to steer clear of that to the best of your ability, to work really hard, to pay cash for the things that you want to buy. Uh, it's a miserable way to live to be in financial debt. But I want you to understand, listen, that each of us, each of us carry another debt that is equally distressing and has an even greater impact on us as people. You say, what are you talking about? Well, in this In this text, Paul talks about some debts that are owed. He talks about some individuals that that were in debt, and he talks about how how to deal with that debt and what the response ought to be. And, And this just literally leapt off the page to me as I was studying. Here's what he says. Paul says that the wrong that Onesimus had done against Philemon could be viewed as a debt that was owed. Now let that sink in for just a moment. If if every time I wrong someone, if every time I sin against someone, if every time I offend someone, I'm accumulating more and more debt, how much debt do you suppose I'm in? I'm in a whole lot. Nobody in this room knows me better than I know me, And I can assure you that I am in a great deal of debt if if every time that I I, I say a cross word or I offend someone or I hurt someone or or I'm rude to someone or whatever the case might be, if if, if that can be viewed as a debt that is owed, well, then I'm in a a lot of debt. Now, he also also indicated that that that, that there's another type of debt that we can owe. So as we think about the wrong that is being done to someone and viewing that as debt that is owed, we understand, well, that's Onesimus with Philemon. 
Onesimus was a slave to Philemon until, until, we, until he would have stolen some money and he would have run away uh, from Philemon. Uh, he had abandoned his responsibility, his post, and he took off hoping never to see Philemon ever again. And Paul says because of that offense, because of that sin, because of that wrongdoing, uh, Onesimus owes a debt. But notice he says in verse number 19, he says, but Philemon, you owe me something as well. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, well, what wrong did Philemon do if, 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 debt, if spiritual debt can be viewed as something that, is, that I've done that is wrong towards someone, puts me in debt, then, then what did Philemon do that was wrong? And as far as we can tell, he didn't do anything that was wrong. No, instead, instead here's, here's the type of debt that Philemon owes. Philemon owes a debt in which kindness had been shown to him and, and he had received that kindness without really being able to recompense in return. Well, man, I gotta tell you, as I'm studying this, I'm thinking to myself, man, my hole was, dig enough, but was deep enough as it was. When I start thinking about the wrong that I do and understanding that every sin against someone else can be viewed as a form of debt, but now on top of it, if I look at my life and understand Every time someone has shown me kindness that I maybe didn't deserve that kindness or perhaps I, I could not repay them for that kindness, I also am going deeper and deeper into debt. Well, then I just gotta tell you, I've had a lot of people show me grace. A lot of people show me mercy. A lot of people show me love and kindness. And as a result, boy, my debt, my debt is, is maybe even deeper than the historic national debt that we talked about just a moment ago. In our text, Paul indicates that Onesimus is in debt to Philemon. But before Philemon can you know, begin to collect on this debt that he is owed, Paul reminds him of a very important truth. He says, I want you to know something. You're in debt as well. But Paul would write, listen, Paul would also write in other places, not necessarily here, but Paul would write in other places, hey, before, you know, before I get too much down on Philemon and before I say much about Onesimus, I also need to be reminded I'm in debt too. Well, so he says in Romans chapter one and verse number 14, he says, I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Paul's admission of debt to the Greeks and to the barbarians is an acknowledgement that he must, he must reach them for the cause of Christ. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, God has shown me so much grace, so much mercy and forgiveness. God has chosen me as a, as a, as a specific vessel to reach the Gentiles. That's what God told Ananias shortly after Saul's salvation. In Acts 9, verse number 15, the Lord said unto him, speaking of Ananias about the apostle Paul, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And listen, Paul would spend the rest of his life under, listen, under that burden of debt, doing everything that he could to try to, to, try to pay back and to re restore to God the kindness that had been shown to him. So Paul's desire to reach the Greeks and the barbarians, the wise and the unwise, the debt that he owed, really it flowed from a proper understanding of how much he owed the Lord for what God had done in his life. And can we just pause for a moment tonight and can we stop and think about how much, how much we owe based on the goodness of God in our lives? A debt that you and I could never fully repay but we ought at least to be determined to give it our all to repay this debt. But Paul, listen, Paul acknowledged, listen, another impactful truth in this text. And not, it's not only this, that listen, every one of us carry a spiritual debt in some respects. When we think about the people that we have wronged and we think about the kindness that has been shown to us and understand, man, I, I, I owe some people. I'm in debt to some people because of my life or because of the kindness that they've shown to me. But listen, Paul acknowledges another impactful truth, and that is this, that the debt, listen, the debt that is owed can be canceled out by the lender. The debt that is owed can be canceled out by the lender or by the creditor. This could happen uh, by Philemon choosing to forgive Onesimus for the wrong that he had done. And that's what Paul is urging him to do. He's saying, listen, Listen, Philemon, would you, just, would you just cancel that debt that is owed? 
Would you just, would you just sort of forget about it and, and, and move on? If there were, he says, if there are outstanding bills that need to be repaid, he says, I'm, I'm willing to step in to pay those things. If, if Philemon, he says, if Philemon, if you're to balk at simple forgiveness at this proposal that I'm making, Paul reminds him, Paul reminds him that at one time, at one time you owed a debt to me that I simply canceled out in your favor. The implication is that the debt owed by Philemon to Paul was one of kindness uh, that could never be repaid. I personally believe that this debt centered on the fact that, that Paul was the one to introduce Philemon to Jesus Christ. And as a result, for the rest of his life, Philemon would say, man, how, how, could I ever, how could I ever pay back, Paul, what you did for me in telling me about Jesus? And can I just say, I don't know who it was that introduced you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody. Can I just remind you that, you know, in some respects, you owe a debt to that person. Now, they didn't save you, but they were the one, they were the one responsible as a human being uh, to open their mouth and to proclaim or preach to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, when you think about that person, there ought to be a, a debt of gratitude. You know what you ought to do? You ought to say, one of the ways I can repay that debt is by doing the same thing for others that was done for me. Same kindness that was shown to me. I'm going to pass it along uh, to others. And so uh, Paul references uh, this, uh, this particular element. And, uh, and, and he says, listen, Philemon, because of my ministry among you, uh, you've trusted Christ and your life, your family, and your future is forever changed. And how could he repay Paul for what he had done? He could never. Paul says, that's okay. That's okay. I'm not holding this debt over you. That's all right. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just urging you to try to treat others the same way that I treated you and that I did for you. Now listen, there may be someone in this room who has uh, someone you know that is in great debt to you. And perhaps when you think about that individual, maybe, maybe the thoughts are not as pleasant because of some debt that uh, is owed to you. Perhaps maybe they've offended you in some way. Or maybe, maybe you've shown them kindness and you just never sensed that there was really a, a, a spirit of gratitude that should have been there. You've longed for the day when you can be remunerated from that debt. But maybe, just maybe what the Lord wants you to do tonight is just simply to cancel that debt. Just to forgive them. Just to try to move on. Try to move beyond it. Can I say that contextually, every debt that we hold as a creditor should be canceled when the debtor comes with a humble heart and asks for forgiveness. In other words, some of you are sitting here saying, well, I, I, I would definitely forgive that person. And in some respects, I've moved on in my own mind. If they ever came to me and they express, expressed con confession and repentance and wanted to be restored to me, I would restore them immediately. Uh, but I'm simply saying, listen, our responsibility as believers is when someone comes to us, according to Christ's teaching, when they come to us and they say, listen, I'm sorry for what I've done. I, I offended you. I know I offended you. I hurt you in some way. Would you forgive me? We have a responsibility, listen, to cancel cancel that debt, to cancel it completely. That's the context was being said, stated here. Now, I do believe that those who have stolen, those who have taken something, even from this text, that they should restore and they should determine, I'm not going to steal anymore, according to Ephesians 4.28. Can I say it is possible to cancel a debt that is owed to you without being remunerated? I remind you that Christ canceled the debt of a woman caught in adultery, didn't he? The Bible says that they brought her to him. He was teaching there in the synagogue. They cast her at his feet. And they said, here's what we've, we caught her doing. I've, always, I've often thought to myself, well, why didn't, you, why didn't you bring the man to Jesus' feet as well? I mean, you can't, you can't commit adultery with, uh, with just one person. Where was the man? I don't know where the man was. The Bible doesn't tell us. Seems to be maybe a hit job on the, uh, on the woman. But they, they, bring the, they bring the woman to Jesus. And you know the story. What does he do? He cancels the debt. What, is, what does the law require? The law requires that she be stoned, that she be killed because of what she's done. What did Jesus say? Jesus, Jesus said, I don't, I'm not here to condemn you. What does he say? Go and sin no more. How, 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 dear lady, how can you repay this debt? The only way you can repay this debt is by walking away from this encounter and say, I'm never gonna do that again. I've been forgiven I'm never, I'm never gonna go back to that lifestyle ever again. She could not pay what was owed, and yet Christ forgave her anyways. Can I remind you that if we're ever to look like our heavenly father, may it be in this area of erring 
too much on the side of too much mercy, too much grace, and too much forgiveness. I think that'd be a good thing for us, don't you suppose? If, if, we're, gonna, if we're gonna err, if we're gonna make a mistake, let's, let's make a mistake by giving too much mercy and too much grace and too much forgiveness as opposed to not nearly enough. And what, what I'm saying is this, listen, be quick to cancel the debts owed to you and to receive and restore a fallen brother. I wanna share with you three uh, specific spiritual truths that I just kind of have thought about as it relates to debt as, as we think about this passage. Number one, I wanna remind you that like Onesimus in our text, really like every individual that is mentioned, Onesimus, Philemon, and Paul, because we've looked at all of them, but like Onesimus tonight, every man owes a great debt. Like Onesimus, every man owes a great debt. Verse number 18, if he hath wronged thee. What does he say? If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. The debt of Onesimus had to deal with how he had wronged Philemon. And as we stated before, debt can be that which I have done wrong against an individual, or it can be the kindness that I've been shown. In this context, we're talking specifically about Onesimus here. And the debt that he owed was centered on the wrong or the offense that he had committed against Philemon. Can I just remind you that in this room tonight, no one here knows me better than me. And so you're just gonna have to take my word for it tonight. But I, want, I just want you to know something. I struggle with wrongdoing. I do. Um, and I would, I would wholly and totally expect if any of you were standing in the position that I'm standing in tonight and you are preaching a similar message, that you would admit the same thing because it's true about all of us. All of us are great sinners. All of us are. I can be, I can be selfish. I can be prideful, lazy, covetous, angry, contentious, wicked, and deceitful. Listen, I can be all of these in one day. I, 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 I'll, just be, I'll just shoot straight with you. Sometimes I can be all of these within a moment. I mean, I, 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 can, I can blow right through every stop sign and I can offend in just about every way in a short amount of time. Listen, you don't have to take my word for it. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's, let's hear what the Bible has to say about us as people. Let's hold our place in Philemon and let's go to Romans chapter three. I don't suppose that there's hardly any text in the Bible that paints uh, as, as um, graphic of a picture about us as, as, as sinners as Romans chapter number three. Would you look in verse number 10? The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now he really gets into the heart of things. Look at verse 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, you know what the vast majority of the world thinks about themselves? If you were to talk to someone, the average person tonight, and you were to ask themselves, you know, what kind of person are you? Most people, speaking in this context, they'd say, I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty good. I'm all right, and, and you, know why, you know why we say that is because we, we, here's what we like to do. We like to play the comparison game. And so, and so I can always, listen, I can always find someone worse than me. I mean, Brother Adrian's here tonight. I can always find somebody worse than me, right? <laughs> uh, and so can you. Um, and, and, and so that leads us to this idea of, well, I'm okay. I'm really not all that bad. But then we read what the Bible has to say about us. And it is not a pretty picture. I mean, it's ugly. Well, what's found here? The Bible, the Bible does not hold back in any way, shape, or form. In very graphic terms, the Bible tells us just how wicked you and I truly are. The next time, the next time you're tempted to think, I'm really not that bad. Perhaps maybe it's as you're looking at someone who lives down the street from you or maybe you're driving down the road and you see someone stumbling around in an alcoholic stupor or perhaps maybe in a drug-induced stupor and you think to yourself, well, you know, I'm not as bad as that person. Think to yourself this, had it not been for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where I could be. And be reminded, be reminded, listen, we're all the same. We're all wicked sinners. And the only difference between me 
and someone else living out on the streets or living some wicked life is the difference that Christ has made in my life. That's the only difference. That's it. This is what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, 20. I think some of these verses will appear on the screen. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That man, listen, that man does not exist. There's no such thing as a man who lives on the earth who is just, who always does good, and he doesn't sin. That man doesn't exist except for Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Here's what the Bible says in um, 1 John 1, verse number eight. For if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know the person who says, I'm really not that bad? That bad? You know who's hurting the most? He's hurting himself. He's lying about himself. He has convinced himself. By the way, you've all met someone who, who is, has told enough lies that they believe their own lies. And that's the type of person we're dealing with here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the Bible says, and the truth is not in us. Going on to verse number 10, it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. Well, God doesn't lie, the Bible's clear, and his word is not in us. The scriptures, listen, are quite clear that I am a sinner who owes a great debt to God who created me and who is my judge. My sin and my wrongdoing might offend you, but listen, ultimately, ultimately, my sin is against God. In other words, I, I, could, I, could, I could offend you tonight by the way that I interact with you, maybe something that I say or an attitude that I have towards you, and that would be wrong. But listen, listen, what I need to remind myself is, of, of is this, is that every sin that I commit is ultimately against God in heaven. That's what David said. David wrote in his, uh, in his um, Psalm of 51.4, he says, against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. And the Bible says in Genesis 39 and verse number nine, Joseph speaking to Potiphar's wife in the midst of this great temptation, he said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? That's not what he said. Now that would be Potiphar's wife, but that's not what he said. He said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Onesimus owed Philemon perhaps a certain dollar amount. You know, if he worked really, really hard, he might have been able to pay for it in some, in, in, in some amount of time. Can I remind you that my debt, your debt, cannot be measured in dollars and cents. My sin debt is impossible for me to pay. The only acceptable payment for my sin debt is death and the shedding of blood. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood is no remission. Onesimus owed Philemon in this text. That's what we're talking about. It's one flawed man owing another flawed man. And that's bad enough. But listen, my debt is much greater. I'm in debt to God. In other words, that's one flawed man, me, in debt to a perfect, eternal, all-powerful, holy God. Listen, being in debt is a miserable way to live. As I got to thinking about the fact that every man, like Onesimus, is in debt, it began to dawn on me, no wonder our world's so unhappy. No wonder our world is so miserable. Every person is born, listen, every person is born into this world in an impossible situation owing a debt to the God of the universe that they can never pay. Is it any wonder that this world is so miserable and so unhappy and so unfulfilled? And here's, here's, what, here's what most people will do. Most people will work their entire lives trying to pay this debt and they'll never realize that this debt cannot be paid with good work. Have you ever gotten yourself into a situation in which perhaps maybe you got into some car, credit card debt and, uh, and every month you're just making the minimum payment and by the time it's all said and done, when you come to the end of that month and you've made the minimum payment, the, the, the debt is actually increasing, it's not coming down. And you look at that statement and you think to yourself, my soul, am I ever gonna get out of this mess? When you start thinking about the interest and the compounding of that and perhaps maybe even putting more money on the card just to survive and then paying, uh, then paying the, the minimum payment only and watching that the number is not going down, the number is going up. I'm sort of weird, I'm sort of funny. I get my mortgage statement every month and I always wanna look and see how much did it go down. And it's pathetic how little it goes down <laughs> compared to how much I'm paying. I mean, absolutely pathetic, but I still wanna see it. A couple hundred dollars a month, I'm seeing the thing go down. I'm thinking to myself, you know, about 500 years from now, we're gonna have this house paid for. <laughs> we're gonna get there. <laughs> but you know, in, in many respects, listen, the world, that's what they're doing. Their, their, their works, listen, their works 
in essence, it's, it's making minimum payments on a debt that is so high and is so out of control they'll, they'll, because, because minimum payments can never pay the debt. Minimum payments are never gonna get it done. Minimum payments will never satisfy a holy, eternal, all-powerful, almighty God. But that's what our world's doing. It's no wonder they're so miserable because they're in debt with no hope of ever getting out on their own. And only secondly, we discover we discover that faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ cancels my debt. In verses 18 and 19, we see that Paul is urging Philemon to cancel Onesimus' debt. And he, and he does so based on his own willingness to pay Onesimus' debt. In other words, he says, listen, listen, just forgive him. And if he owes something, listen, I'm good for it. I will take care of it. Next time I see you, I'll write a check for it. I'll take care of it. You know, there's been a lot of talk in recent days about debt cancellation, hasn't there? One side of a political aisle seems to want to cancel what is known as student loan debt in an effort to seemingly score some political points, while the other side of the aisle argues that this can't be done unless someone else pays for it. They're saying, listen, the taxpayer is ultimately going to be stuck with this bill. In other words, you can't just cancel debt. It's impossible. Sure, if you want to, you can say, okay, it's canceled. You don't have to ever pay it back. But that money's got to be paid back somehow. It may not be paid back by the person who took the loan out to begin with, but somebody's going to be stuck with that bill. And yet Paul here is urging Philemon to cancel the debt. Under what grounds? Under the grounds that I will pay what is owed. You say, what's the point spiritually? The point spiritually is our great Savior says to us, I've canceled your debt. You say, well, how, how, how can you cancel my debt? My debt is owed. It's impossible for you. I've canceled your debt because I have paid what is owed. I have shed my blood. I have died in your place. I'm the only one. I'm the only one who can pay your sin debt. That's what Christ did for us. Christ, the Son of God, was sinless throughout his 33 and a half years of life here on this earth. He was born of a virgin, which allowed him to be a man, but at the same time bypassed the sin nature that flows through all men. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. But the death of Christ, listen, was not to satisfy Christ's sin debt. He had no sin debt. The death of Christ was to satisfy my sin debt. By acknowledging that Christ died to pay my sin debt and by accepting this free gift that is offered to me, here's what God does. God cancels my sin debt by putting it on Christ's account. Now, that's really what's being done here. Paul is just sort of a picture of Christ. He's saying, listen, cancel what Onesimus owes. Oh, you can't cancel it? He owes you still some money? No problem, put it on my account. I will pay it for him. Jesus does the exact same thing for us. And he bears all of our sin on a cross. So how do I take advantage? How do I take advantage of that payment that has been made? The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Well, why did he die? He died for my sins. He was buried, but he didn't stay dead. No, God raised him from the dead the third day. Thou shalt be saved for the heart and believeth unto righteousness when the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's really simple. It goes on to say in a few verses later, for whosoever, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that word whosoever a beautiful word? Because that means anybody in here. Anybody in here. Anyone you know, anyone you've ever met, anyone who's ever been born is part of that whosoever. If they'll simply come to the Lord and call upon him, they can be saved. Let me say three, thirdly and finally tonight, freedom from debt transforms a man. Freedom from debt transforms a man. You know, one of the reasons folks should avoid financial debt is because of the freedom it affords them in life. You know, making consistent payments on debt, it keeps me from building wealth. It keeps me from doing the things that maybe I'd like to be doing. I've discovered that those who don't owe anything to anyone, they can typically buy whatever they want to buy. They can eat wherever they want to eat, and they can travel wherever they want to travel. It seems to be an incredible way to live, free from the burden of debt hanging over you. Now, considering that on the financial side, can I, can, I make this, uh, can I make this transition and say that it is wise to look at how Paul's freedom from debt transformed him? 
If I have also been forgiven of my debt, then I should live similarly to Paul. Three things that we'll find in this text when we'll be done tonight. Number one, Paul advocated for others to be debt free. In other words, Paul, after, after Paul, Paul had all of his debt canceled by the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what Paul would do for the rest of his life. He would go everywhere, everywhere, and he would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what he would do. He would tell people, hey, listen, one day I was in debt. My debt was growing by, by leaps and bounds, and I was doing everything in my power to try to pay it, but I couldn't pay it. One day I was introduced to Jesus Christ, and I was, I was told that Jesus paid my sin debt for me, and I placed all of my faith and all of my trust in him, and he forgave me of all of my sin. He canceled all of my debt, and he can do the same thing for you. That, that's what Paul spent the rest of his days doing. And I think what, I'm, what, what we're hinting at here tonight is this. Listen, if that's the difference that Paul's cancellation of his debt made in his life, if you've been canceled of your debt, if you've been forgiven, are you under any less obligation to do the exact same thing? To everyone you meet, to every person you come across, to share with them what Christ has done for you. If your debt has been canceled, a passion, a passion should burn in you to let others know that the burden of debt they're carrying can be lifted by Jesus Christ. How faithful, how faithful are we to share this good news with others? But notice, secondly, Paul sought to reward the kindness he had been shown by blessing others with generous acts of kindness. Twice in these verses, he offers to pay the financial debt incurred by Onesimus prior to his conversion. I mean, he says it right there in, the, in, in verses 18 and verse number 19. Notice, notice how, he, how he phrases it here. He says in verse number 18, he says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Look in verse number 19. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Most people who come to Christ will do so with a, quite a bit of baggage. Seems to be the way that it works. Paul does not hesitate. Listen, Paul does not hesitate to help Onesimus overcome the pain and the baggage of his past, even if it becomes a costly thing for him. I, I think to myself that perhaps maybe Paul thought back to the early days of his conversion. And he thought to himself, you know, when I tried to come into that church in Jerusalem, they were very skeptical of me. And rightly so. I mean, just a few weeks prior, I had been an enemy. I had been someone that they feared. I was someone who hated them and wanted to kill them, wanted to imprison them, wanted to silence their message. And perhaps maybe he thought of a man by the name of Barnabas, a son of consolation. It just simply means he was an encourager. And it seems like Barnabas took Paul alongside it. Eventually, Paul would sort of become the leader of that group, but it seems like in the early days, Barnabas led Paul, and Barnabas discipled Paul, and, and Barnabas uh, helped Paul to assimilate into the local church and, and, and perhaps maybe made things, made things for, a, made for a smoother transition in that particular element of things. And Paul was reminded of that. And Paul thought to himself, you know, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life doing the same thing. I'm certainly gonna meet some people who are gonna need some love and forgiveness and kindness, and I'm gonna show that to them as it was shown to me. Can I just say that kindness and generosity, listen, those things are synonymous with the life of a disciple. Are those qualities present in your life? Those are what the Bible says in Psalm 112, verses four and five. Under the upright, there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. Notice, a good man showeth favor. Notice the next two words, and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. You know what Paul did the rest of his life? Paul, Paul lent the rest of his life. Paul, Paul says, how can I repay this debt? I know how I can repay it. I can repay this debt by lending to other people kindness and generosity, maybe even, even willing to financially cover some things if that's, if that's what's necessary. That's not all. Look what the Bible says in Psalm 112 and verse number nine. He hath dispersed, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness endureth forever, his horn shall be exalted with honor. The Bible says in Luke 6 and verse number 35, but lovely, love ye your enemies and do good, notice the next two words, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. I have to tell you, this is a paradigm shift. This is an attitude adjuster here when I read this. Because the vast majority of, of us, myself included, 
We're kind to those who are kind to us. The Bible says, you wanna look like your heavenly father? Then do this, show kindness to those who are evil. Show kindness to those who do not show kindness to you. I, got, I don't know about you, but that's like taking a knife and putting it right into my chest. Because that's not how we think, and that's not usually how we live. But that's what Jesus said. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 through 2, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Thirdly and finally, the cancellation of Paul's debt led to the cancellation of those indebted to him. Though Philemon owed a great debt to Paul for the influence and the investment that he had made in his life, Paul was not looking to collect on this debt. He, he, he doesn't mention this to kind of keep this thing hanging over Philemon's head. Like, I want you to continue to be reminded, you owe me, you owe me, you owe me. That's not why he says it. No, he says it to spur Philemon to behave as Paul had behaved. He says, listen, you can forgive when you consider what you've been forgiven of. You can cancel debt when you consider you owed me and I canceled it. Now, that's what he's saying. He's not saying that to remind him, oh, you know, I'm still waiting for you to pay up. That's not what Paul is saying, not in any way, shape, or form. He's saying, I have not held your debt against you, therefore do not hold Onesimus' debt against him. And considering the great debt you owed, I owed, the cancellation of that debt through the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, how should our lives be different? I'd say that we should be different because we should be the most loving, kind, generous, and forgiving people on planet Earth. That's the impact the gospel makes in our lives. In other words, listen, debt-free people ought not to walk around holding other people's debt over them. No, debt-free people ought to be saying, how can I help these people become debt-free? That's what we ought to give our lives to. And may, may the gospel make this type of difference in our lives as it did in the lives of these men. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed for just a moment. Thank you so much for being here and your faithfulness to hear teaching and preaching from God's word is a great encouragement. I try to spend quite a bit of time preparing messages and praying and asking the Lord to lead us and to guide us. It's always encouraging to know that folks are being helped and are being taught and perhaps are growing in their faith as a result. I hope you walk away from this service tonight not thinking about some debt that someone owes you, but I hope you walk away from here thinking to yourself, man, I owe, I owe some great debt in my life. And you do, and so do I. So does every one of us. Jesus Christ cancels our debt by bearing our sin upon a cross. What ought, what our, ought our response to be to that? Number one, if we're not saved, we need to be saved. Place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus and live tonight. But if you've been saved, what should your response be? Your response ought to be, Lord, thank you. And Lord, with your help, I'll seek throughout my life to forgive and to cancel the debt of others. I'll look for ways in which I can encourage new believers who perhaps are coming into this life with some baggage of their own some issues of their own that they're contending with, I'll look for ways that I can encourage, ways that I can bless, ways that I can strengthen, ways that I can forgive. You see some room for improvement in your life in this area, why don't you tell the Lord about it right now? Or here's how you've spoken to me tonight, here's what I'm going to do with what I've heard, with your help, by your Spirit's power and by your Spirit's strength. Fathers, we conclude our time together tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word. It's so clear, it's so beautiful, it's so life-giving and liberating. We pray, Lord, that as we're dismissed from this place, that we'll, Lord, we'll mull over what we've heard tonight. May we not just walk out of here and, and, and just carry on with our lives, but may we walk out of here with an overwhelming sense of the great debt that we owe and the great forgiveness and mercy that has been showed by the cancellation of this debt someone here tonight that does not know Christ as their Savior, may they not walk out of this place without talking with someone, asking someone how they can know for sure that heaven is their home and allow us that opportunity to show them from the scriptures the only way to be saved is by believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, acknowledging our sin and our wickedness, acknowledging the penalty for our sin is death. That's the wages of our sin, but God commendeth his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
and folks that are lost, if there are any here tonight, may they be gloriously saved. And then, Lord, may those of us who have been saved, who have experienced this debt cancellation, this debt forgiveness, may we spend the rest of our lives informing others that this type of program, this type of opportunity is available to them, but only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And may we model our Heavenly Father by showing kindness and forgiveness and love and canceling debt at every opportunity that we possibly can. Now bless us as we're dismissed from this place tonight, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.